Welcome everybody to 52 Living Ideas. We are going through Tao the Ching. Um, and today we are on poem or chapter number three. So we'll start with people reading their favorite translations. And I'm gonna start with uh, Jason. Jason, go ahead. Okay, so uh, first uh, let me uh, take, okay, let, let me say something bef uh, before I started, uh, just uh, what uh, Yasushi talked mm -hmm. about the three point. Okay, mm -hmm. I just said, yeah, I, uh, uh, that, that's, that's correct. I heard this kind. So Tao Te Ching is not one author, that's a correction. The, okay, but there's no any proof is one author or more than one, but everything just a uh, 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 theory, okay? So another thing about this one is written 500 BC, but it's very possible being created the later day and they predated because that's why they say, he seems like he know many things because they are created much later time. That's another theory, it's also possible. So, okay, so let's go start it. And I'm going to read the Chinese first, then I'm going to read in uh, my translation. Okay, uh, Chinese usually is very short. Uh, okay. Okay, uh, I'm going to read my English version. Um, I can look at this one at least in the three section. Okay, the first section basically talk about, uh, okay, by not exalting the talented, you will cause the people to cease from rivalry and the contention. By not prizing goods hard to get, you will cause the people to cease from robbing and stealing. By not displaying what is desirable, you will cause the people's hearts to remain undisturbed. That's the first part. And the second part, therefore, the sage, the sage way of governing begin by emptying the hearts of desires, filling the belly with food, weakening the ambitions, toughening the bones. And then we go to the third, uh, the third section. In this way, he will cause the people to remain without knowledge and without desire and prevent the knowledge, uh, and prevent the knowledge, uh, sorry, and prevent the knowing ones from any ado. Well, my translation use ado, uh, I just want to make sure it's A-D-O, okay? And some translation call it uh, action or nonsense action, okay? Practice non ado and everything will be in order. Okay, so that's the uh, last sentence. So, uh, should I explain or? I uh, no, what we'll do is that we'll have all the translations uh, in first and then we will go ahead okay, and go ahead. Uh, talk about, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll do the explanations then. Um, all right, folks, so go ahead and type exclamation mark if you'd like to read your translation. Judith. If you overesteem great men, people become powerless. If you overvalue possessions, people begin to steal. The master leads by emptying people's minds and filling their cores, by weakening their ambition and toughening their resolve. He helps people lose everything they know, everything they desire, and creates confusion in those who think that they know. Practice non do Practice not doing, and everything will fall into place. Wonderful, thank you. Uh, James, did you want to read? Uh, sure. I have the DC Lao translation. Mm -hmm. It goes like this. Not to honor men of worth will keep the people from contention. Not to value goods which are hard to come by will keep them from theft. Not to display what is desirable will keep them from being unsettled of mind. The second part. Therefore, in governing the people, the sage empties their minds, but fills their bellies. 
weakens their wills, but strengthens their bones. He always keeps them innocent of knowledge and free from desire and ensures that the clever never dare to act. Do that which consists in taking no action and order will prevail. Wonderful, thank you. Uh, next up is going to be Evanique, Joe and Brian. Evanique. Okay. If you give leaders power, people become powerless. If you value material things, people will want them and do anything to get them. Christ leaves by having nothing, emptying minds of desires, feeding the hungry, weakening worldly ambitions, and strengthening the spirit. He calls people to give up everything, to live simply and free from the desires of the eyes, the lusts of the flesh, and the pride of the mind. Do nothing by your own strength, and God will accomplish all things. Thank you, Ebony. Uh, next up is Joe, Brian, and Dave. Joe. Sure. This is the Wayne uh, Dyer version. Uh, putting a value on status will create contentiousness. If you overvalue possessions, people begin to steal. By not displaying what is desirable, you will cause the people's hearts to remain undisturbed. The stage governs by emptying, emptying minds and hearts, by weakening ambitions and strengthening bones. Practice not doing. When action is pure and selfless, everything settles into its own perfect place. Thank you, Joe. Uh, next up is Brian, followed by Dave. Brian. Okay. Um, I've already, I've also been reading from the, the DC Lao interpretation, but we've had that, so I'm not going to read that. I found a new one today, um, which has got an interesting connotation for me in, in the explanations he gives. But for now, I'll, I'll just read his interpretation of, of poem three. Exalt not the wise, so that the people shall not scheme and contend. Prize not rare objects, so that the people shall not steal. Shut out from sight the things of desire, so that the people's hearts shall not be disturbed. Therefore, in the government of the sage, he keeps empty their hearts, makes full their bellies, discourages their ambition strengthens their frames so that the people may be innocent of knowledge and desires and the cunning ones shall not presume to interfere by action without deeds may all live in peace thank you brian next up is going to be dave dave go ahead thanks Shikan. by not elevating the worthy you bring it about that people will not compete by not valuing goods that are hard to obtain, you bring it about that people will not act like thieves. By not displaying the desirable, you bring it about that people will not be confused. Therefore, in the government of the sage, he empties their minds and fills their bellies, weakens their ambition and strengthens their bones. He constantly causes the people to be without knowledge and without desires. If he can bring about that those with knowledge simply do not dare to act, then there is nothing that will not be in order. Wonderful, thank you. Uh, thank you, Dave. Uh, so let's go to commentaries. Uh, Maritza, go ahead. Uh, anybody else who wants to read uh, their translations, please go ahead and type exclamation mark. Maritza. Um, Shikant, if I may, mm -hmm. if it's okay. I wanted to read one in Spanish today. Please. So this one's translated by Juan Ignacio Preciado, mm -hmm. and he tends to be um, my favorite um, Spanish translator. Um, and I just, I like the way this one goes a little bit better than all the ones I read in, Eng in English. Si no se eleva a los hombres de mérito, no habrá disputas entre el pueblo. Si no se valoran los objetos difíciles de conseguir, no existirán ladrones en el pueblo. 
Si no se deja ver lo que puede provocarle el deseo, no se producirán disturbios populares. Por eso el gobierno del sabio es vaciar la mente del pueblo, llenar su estómago, debilitar su ambición y fortalecer sus huesos. Hacer siempre que el pueblo no tenga conocimientos ni deseos. Hacer que los inteligentes no se atrevan a gobernar, no actuar en una palabra. Y entonces reinará la orden universal. Thank you. Thanks, Marisa. Uh, next up is going to be Madeline, followed by Franklin. Madeline. Yes, uh, I have the translation by Jafu Fung in Jane English. Not exalting the gifted prevents quarreling. Not collecting treasures prevents stealing. Not seeing desirable things prevents confusion of the heart. The wise therefore rule by emptying hearts and stuffing bellies, by weakening ambitions and strengthening bones. If people lack knowledge and desire, then intellectuals will not try to interfere. If nothing is done, then all will be well. Wonderful, thank you. Uh, next up is Franklin. Well, that was delightful. I was gonna read Jafu Feng, but why don't I read something that I did? This is my translation. Wonderful. And I did it quickly, so I, you know, I, I, this is, uh, a rough draft. Mm -hmm. Egotists and psychophants breed disharmony. Equanimity pacifies unrest. Riches attract thieves. Free of desire, the culture comes to no contentment. The wise rule by example. They feed the hungry. They eliminate the need to put on airs and nourish healthy habits. Without any need for guile, nor living on the edge like desperados, then complicated assistance programs are no longer necessary. If there's no one forsaken, then everyone can experience wholeness. Wonderful, thank you. Thank you, Franklin. Uh, that really, really appreciate your reading, your translation, thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, all right, folks, so now it's time for commentary. Um, we can go ahead, we can look at it as a whole and we can just talk about it as a whole. So anybody who wants to talk about, uh, you know, give their commentary, um, go ahead and type exclamation mark. Jason. Uh, yeah, before everybody comment, let me uh, point out uh, one, uh, uh, one thing, you know, um, uh, I just, based on the uh, text, the original text. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, everybody translates as the therefore, and they have the sage. I believe everybody had almost the same, uh, translated the same. And basically they talk about therefore, uh, the sage governing or whatever. So, so we talk about the sage, at least the sage is in the political sage, okay? And uh, uh, because if it's uh, not political or moral, the text will use uh, gentleman or so-called Junzi. So it's all talk about governing. And the, the very last word, okay, usually the translation talk about practice non-action, then everything will be in order. Okay. So I just like to point out the last word is the same as governing. So the translation, I will say all translator, they put their own meaning on that because at the beginning they talk about the original text, talk about governing and the same word, okay? So the correct reading, okay? I'm not saying you should do this one, but I talk about strict Chinese reading will be the sage governing, okay? The, without action, everything will be governed, okay? And in other words, that means you can say being governed will be in order. So I just like to point out, they use the same word, okay? And then uh, uh, you, you look at from the ruler's point of view, and at the end, you look at from the uh, ruled point of, point of view. That's a little bit swap. Okay. So that, that's the thing I want to point out. That means we should, we have to read this way, but that's, uh, I think that's my responsibility mm -hmm. to tell everybody that's the situation. 
Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Jason. Um, next up is going to be Joe. Joe, what did you get from this one? Uh, I mean, from this particular uh, verse, uh, I, the idea of humility, really, I, you know, by not displaying what is desirable, you will cause the people's hearts to remain undisturbed. And by remaining humble, that people won't desire what you want. Uh, the idea that uh, of temperance is the way the sage should govern using the virtue of temperance as well. Uh, and also the um, when action is pure and selfless and everything settles into perfect place, uh, the idea of water came to mind and how something is, you know, it settles perfectly and it's pure. And it's one of the elements that we've discussed here in the past. So uh, as being one of the most powerful as well. Uh, those are just some initial thoughts. I actually had some other uh, things uh, written down, but I'll just leave it there for now. Thank you. Uh, next up is Maritza. Um, what I liked about this um, chapter was similar to what Joe is saying, just this on admonition to, um, you know, we, we create by not being aware that there are two sides to every situation, we create an imbalance when we honor one overly much over another. Specifically for the, um, the Spanish version that I, I presented, I liked that it was stated from a perspective of the town, the community, um, and it was a stress of, for there to exist harmony within a group of people, we cannot elevate one above the others. And that's, that just, again, that speaks to me because, you know, by, by now you've, <laughs> I'm an old record, right? I'm always talking about how I think that the community is as important as the individual and we have to find ways to, you know, elevate both. And, and that's kind of what I'm hearing here in this third one. Um, I will say that I, I was a little bit put off by some versions, both in English and Spanish, there were very, there, there were many that say that the way it's translated, and I would love to hear somebody who, who can read the characters on this, the idea of, there's a section that talks about um, dampening the intellect, but it's, some of the translations seem to state that it's a matter of keeping people like dumb. And um, I just, naturally, I was averse to anything that said anything to do with that, and a lot of people here read many that had nothing to do with that. So there, there exists many varieties. Um, the, the Spanish one puts it in a manner of what you do is, you know, you feed the soul, you dampen the um, harsh desires and you fortify the character. And because the, the thing is, if you fortify the character of each individual, now what you're doing is you're elevating the entire town, the entire community. And that is the way that we have, and what they say, they call it universal order, is um, maintained by um, not putting one over others. And, and I really, I, I like that. I think, at least for me, the ones that spoke to me more were the ones that focused more on, you know, what one should focus on as opposed to what not to focus on, or like, you know, some of them were a little overly negative for me. Thank you. Uh, next up is going to be Jason. Jason, go ahead. Uh, yeah, I, I think the, uh, um, uh, uh, Marisa put a very good point. Um, I think that this, that the sentence, this sentence is very controversial over many thousand years because the original text, that means, I think the translation base is correct. Make people without knowledge, without desire, okay? So that's a kind of, so basic, the, uh, uh, the interpretation. I, I, I like to hear uh, everybody, how do you think of this one? If you think about like Lao Tzu is talking to the ruler, okay? He, at that time, he probably talking against the Confucianism teaching, okay? That's why I said, Mark probably it's predated, okay? Because much later time Confucius become popular. So they predated. So they talk about like Confucius, just like uh, today's elite system, the school are so competitive. So the people kind of lost the morality and other things. People only think about competing, get 
go into the good, the student that want to go to the good college, is that the right thing or not the right thing? So if we reverse, it, try to think a positive way, uh, is the way to think about this. You know, if we all push for the best, okay, and then is that always good or not? Not so good. I think that's another way to think about. It. Thank you. Thank you, Jason. Uh, next up is going to be Kevin, Paul, Madeline, Evanique, and Franklin. Kevin. Thank you, Srikan. Uh, I got just now I seen one link. Actually, that link uh, have a reading. I would say they have background music, very traditional. You hear like you enjoy the music. Uh, uh, Kevin, could you speak up a little bit? Uh, speak into the mic a little bit. Okay, it's better. Yes, much better. Yeah. Uh, I think you link that uh, next time you can uh, click there inside uh, get a uh, play button. For as if you know the number, right? One, two, three. You can hear the background music. It's uh, it's a very it's like a real poem way. Right? Very nice. Um, my my uh, funny you know, one is about uh, empty the mind or empty the. A heart fill up the belly, right? People, yes, yeah, that's uh, you think about that moment meditation. That's uh, beautiful. And uh, and let's see, uh, you have a trouble. Let's see, think you cannot get get around. You say empty, empty the mind, fill up the belly, go to a bed, sleep. And uh, so the first one, uh, Jason, I mentioned that this chapter is uh, I also seen a post on the base wiki. It called Wu Wei Er Zi. That's no, yeah, that's the key point. Uh, how, how about summary of the, this chapter? No, no action is action. So less, less control is control. Small government may be better than big government. I'm going to pause here. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Kevin. Uh, next up is going to be Paul, uh, followed by Madeline. Paul. Yeah, thanks. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm wondering if other people see this the way I'm seeing it, which is right at the center of this pitched battle over whether it's okay to want possessions and things. Like, we, we have even in other groups like the Self-Improved Fridays, and there's books like Think and Grow Rich. There's guys like Jack Canfield, I think his name is, and they go, you poor person, you've been programmed to think that it's wrong to try to want your Tesla and your Lamborghinis and your mansions, and, and you have to get over that programming. It's not wrong at all. Well, this is that programming. So are we right at the center of that battle when the people who like the guy in North Korea who said he's now going to try to counter capitalist influences. Is he in some just way talking about this? I, that's just one example, but is that how to look at this as right at the center of that controversy is sort of my question and observation. Sure. Um, so we'll take all the questions uh, in the second phase uh, where we'll go, go through you know, all, all questions at, at once. Uh, but it's a good, good, good thing to kind of put the question on the table. Uh, next up, is give me a second. I've lost it. Uh, next up is going to be Madeline, followed by Evanique. Yes. Um, well, I appreciate all the positivity that people are feeling about this one. Uh, I don't see it in quite such a bright light. Uh, the phrase "bread and circuses" comes to mind. Uh, keep people fed. Keep them ignorant. Keep them working hard so their bones are strong and uh, keep them from wanting things above their station. And that way there will be no rebellion. I think that uh, might be an equally valid reading of the poem. Um, I, I don't hear uh, Lao Tzu in this one saying um, something like, you know, teach them about the Tao or let the Tao blossom among them or anything like that. It's more like, what the uh, top-down ruler should be doing to keep the populace under control. Thank you. Um, thank you, Madeline. Uh, Jason had a comment and then Phil. Uh, Jason. 
Uh, specifically, I'd like to comment on what the Madeline talked about this. And uh, I just have to say, you read correctly if I uh, say, if you read just by the face value, that's 100%. That's what uh, Lao Zi is telling, or oh, by, by assuming, assuming Lao Zi is telling a ruler what to do. I think what you say is correct. Okay. Uh, uh, but one thing is, uh, I have to correct you. He didn't say, people have to work hard. That's nothing like this, because the work hard is not the, uh, the way of doing it. Basically, it's don't touch, don't do anything, don't appreciate that, say, okay, doing this is better, don't do this, don't set the moral standard, let them do whatever. So another way, treat people as an animal. So there's no rebellion, everybody will be peaceful. They take care of themselves. That's the tone. Thank you. Thank you. Next up is uh, Phil, followed by Evanik. Phil. Phil, you need to unmute yourself. Sorry, sorry. There does seem to be a tone of nostalgia here because it seems like he's trying to deal with governing, if this is about governing, uh, which itself is already corrupted. And he's trying to get back to a point where people begin to respond in, in a much more community way. And so therefore, in a sense, you almost have to at least go back to a kind of tribal sense, because anytime you have a civilization, it does seem like it's very difficult to get people to not have desires and wants uh, beyond the group. And, and so therefore, you have to kind of like put on some kind of restriction. Now, if his, if his restriction is to put uh, kind of like non-restrictions in a way, then in a sense, it's, it's sort of like there's denying that civilization itself has its own demands for structure. And so I think, I think his intention is probably right. I mean, I often say that I am lucky that I was born and lived in a poor family because there are many desires that I didn't need and have, so I didn't strive for so much, so therefore I have much more room to pursue other, that once again is a problem, other desires such as knowledge, you know, and so forth, and beauty or whatever. So I think, I think he, I think there's just a problem of how you institute this sort of spiritual structure within a social society, particularly when it gets large enough that you can't just sort of like communicate directly or non-communicate directly. And it just seems to me like, so there is a tinge uh, to me of a nostalgia, and maybe that's why he sort of left government and just like, you know, like, I just can't quite deal with it. I I'm just leaving. And maybe he's coming back and try to correct the, you know, the emperor, whoever it was, the king. But in some sense, he's already seeing that the, I, I wouldn't say the golden age, but the ideal place is already passed in a way. So I, I'm a little suspicious of that nostalgia. Thank you, Phil. Uh, next up is going to be James followed by Evanik. James, go ahead. Yeah, I think this is a more, more political uh, statement that he's making. And I agree with uh, the question that was asked about how does that fit in with uh, our capitalist society? And it has a lot to do with that. And if you're talking about the Tao in the context of our consumerist society, you could say that the, uh, he's recommending that uh, in order to maintain a, a, an orderly government, a country where people are not just competing and consuming, because they have these extraordinary desires to, to acquire Teslas and, and uh, you know, new you know, gadgets and this and that, but which goes beyond what their needs are, then those extraordinary desires are, are what he's talking about. That in order to you know, have an orderly country where you have some kind of moral principles operating to keep people uh, you know, uh, 
fulfilled or at least at least satisfied, you know, with uh, what they have, then you don't want to, you know, um, <clears throat> promote this kind of um, rampant, uh, you know, consumerism, which is really a kind of like, you know, all this advertising, which really, really kind of like programming people to, oh, I want this, I want that. And these are the kind of desires that I think he's talking about. That once you have those things, you know, and you plant those in people's minds, that's the kind of knowledge that, that he's talking about. He's not talking about intellectual knowledge of self-understanding. He's talking about knowledge like the Christian, uh, you know, uh, idea of Genesis, right? Where the Garden of Eden was a place where the people were happy, but what did they have? What, did, what was their sin, right? It was the knowledge, knowledge of, of the fruit, you know, of, uh, you know, good and evil and so forth. And I think that's that's kind of uh, similar. That once you acquire this knowledge, you know, you have this kind of thing. You have these desires for more more than what you need. And I think that's what he's talking about. Thank you, thank you, James. Uh, next up is going to be Ev Evanique, Franklin, Jean, David, and Marco. Evanique. Yeah. Um, the way I read this was a little different than I think everybody else was reading it. Um, I saw it as kind of like the citizen's role with government, because it starts with, if you give leaders power, or my translation states, if you give leaders power, people become powerless. Like, how do leaders get power? The citizens or the people of the country give it to them. So it, it's like, he's reminding us, like, if you give them power over you, then you you have become powerless and then and then it starts talking about material things and and it says if you value material things and i think valuing is different than wanting if you want something you know it's it's not overwhelming but if you value it like if i value like i want my car cuz it gets me around if I value my car over, let's say, my family, then it it it's a material thing. It can't do anything for me. It'll leave me with a sense of um, emptiness, but not emptiness like the Tao talks about. It's like emptiness, like that's all I want. And you see it in people who are greedy. And, I, and that's why I equate like this whole thing to, it's like, it's not saying don't have desires or don't have wants or don't have needs. It doesn't, to me, it doesn't even say when it talks about intellect, like don't have intellect or don't desire intellect. I think it's when you're greedy about it or you're prideful about it, like people greedy and they just want to consume without thinking about other people that may need something. You know, if I have this, if I'm holding on to something so tightly that I can't give something away to people in need, that's where the problem lies. And I think too, with the desire, uh, my translation has uh, for that last line, and the pride of the mind. It doesn't say that you shouldn't value intellect, but when you use it to show power over people or to make yourself higher than another person, I think that's where it comes in and you're showing pr like pride, like I'm better than you because I have this intellect. So I think it's more about governing yourself is what the way I read it. It's like governing yourself and like also a, a not to be careful of the power that you give people over you. So that's the way I looked at it. Thank you. Thank you, Evanik. Next up is Franklin, followed by Jean. Franklin. I'm really impressed. I, I, it just feels like everybody is really circling around what this is about. And it's very difficult to simplify it. Uh, we were hunter gatherers and somewhere along the way we got into big civilizations. And when we got into big civilizations, a dramatic change occurred. And I think Lao Tzu is trying to guide us back to what we were like for, mil you know, 400,000 years before this maybe four or 5,000 year period 
of these big changes arose. And what arises is, could be called the false self or uh, <clears throat> putting on airs, getting um, <clears throat> possessed by desire. And so that's not there when we're, you know, forced by nature to struggle to survive. You know, you're out fishing, you're out gathering things. Life is desperate, but it's simple. And if we look at primitive cultures, you know, they have a lot of free time and they tend to be pretty, pretty happy. They're not, they're not um, taking drugs to, to defeat depression. Um, depression seems to be a symptom of, of our culture with all this stuff. And, and we're trying to fill a hole with things, but that hole can never be filled. And I think the Tao is circling around shows, you know, this hole, this hole that we're trying to fill, if we turn our attention back and just pay attention to it, it can be painful at first, but eventually, eventually we realize that that, that emptiness is really connected to everything in some marvelous, unspeakable way. So that's, I'm circling around. <laughs> Wonderful, thank you. Thank you, uh, Franklin. Uh, next up is going to be Jean followed by David. Jean. Yeah, so um, my understanding of this chapter is, um, I think it's kind of uh, the wise, the ruler, how to, you know, rule people which may be good for society, like people are not really competitive to each other, like craving for material things. But I think there's a, it's, I wonder, you know, I wonder is that, but like uh, someone mentioned, you know, it's not really teaching everybody's style, so they totally enlightened. So I just wonder is that uh, possible? You know, we hope one day everybody enlightened, you know, then they all self-content. And we reach that um, stage of, you know, third or fourth level of human being. But is that possible? I see even in Greek society, it only seems the elite people seems trying to be enlightened. And I think Dao De Jing too, maybe they're hoping like a few rulers are enlightened so they can rule the people and make them content. But they, even though they're not fully enlightened, but they're happy. So I, it's not the ideal stage for everybody, but um, we hope we can reach that higher stage for everybody, but maybe they didn't see that possible. I don't know. And if it's possible, I wonder. Wonderful, thank you. Uh, next up is going to be David followed by Marco. David. Yes, hi. I guess I'm approaching this differently. I agree a lot with what Madeline said. I mean, in, from like the Lao translation, they say, you know, the sages empties their minds, fills their bellies, weakens their strength, their will, but strengthens their bones, keeps them innocent. I can't understand how this is desirable. I really read this entire chapter as ironic, that the actual recommendation is the opposite of what is being presented, that this is basically like uh, Machiavelli is the prince. This is saying what not to do or how to abuse people. Oh, thank you. Thank you, David. Uh, next up is going to be Phil followed by Marco. Phil. Uh, Phil, you need to unmute yourself. Sorry. Sorry. I think. You want to take the call? Uh, we, we can. No, 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 no. I, I, I'm just waiting for it to stop. It's stop now. Uh, I think the problem might be to institute the infinite in the finite. So it's a metaphysical problem, really. The problem with human being is that we exist in a finite world, a finite existence, I would say, that, that we also want to be in the infinite and somehow have the understanding of the infinite. And I think what that does is causes a rub that you can't fit it together. I always think of it as like slightly differently, you know, there's a speakable world and there's the unspeakable world. That which you could speak, you speak. 
that's what you can't speak, which I'm talking about art, you point to, you make a gesture or whatever. And, there, and then on those, that is even beyond that, you just keep silent. And I think the problem is that he's trying to translate the silence into the speak. And I think that's what, where the rub is. How I personally try to solve that is that to understand that I live in that frictional rub between the two, and I have to constantly equivocate into the, into the limited world and move into the spiritual world and equivocate back and forth. I find this problem, for instance, with Antigone. I mean, Antigone, when I was young, I couldn't find out exactly why she's a tragic hero because she was the purest of the pure. She is like better than I am, certainly, right? But she was living in the spiritual world and she couldn't solve how to exist in the real world. And I think she needed to somehow understand how she could be in the real world and then solve the problem or not, at least not or try to solve the problem and yet be instituted. So you could either align yourself, the physical world to the spiritual world, which seemed to be a very difficult thing because how could unlimited ever reach the, 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 the I mean, how could the limited ever reach the unlimited? But on the other hand, you also have to exist in this world, right? So therefore, in some sense, he is trying to institute this into a thing which, which he should, maybe that's why he walked out. Maybe he should leave that alone and just be a spiritual guy, you know, and sort of point to the unspeakable, you know? And, and I think, because how can you point the government which needs to be spoken into an unspeakable thing. I, 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 think it's, I think it's just a paradox that he is trying to solve that, that I can't figure out how you solve it except to equivocate back and forth and move back and forth between the two and understand that you are, as a human being, trapped in those two worlds, that you have to honor both worlds in the same time. Wonderfully put. Thank you. Thank you, Phil. Really appreciate that. That was great. Uh, next up is going to be Jason, followed by Marco and Andrew. Jason. Uh, yes. Um, as a Chinese reader, I cannot get rid of the political writing on this one. And I also noted most of people look like Chinese usually would see more on political. I think that's the reason. But OK. And then uh, David. Uh, edit, uh, David make an excellent point. Okay, I think you talk, you read it as a political. It's ironic, and he, uh, David, think about it's the Machiavellian thinking. I think that you are exactly right, and very few people point out this one because if you read the famous uh, Chinese legalism Han Fei Zi, okay, who is being compared as the China, early Chinese Machiavellian, he is profound. Um, uh, 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 a reader of the Tao Te Ching. Okay, so he has allowed it. So it's a tightly connected. So it's an excellent point. And it, but it's very difficult to explain within a few minutes. So I will stop here. But before I leave, I'd like to point out something I he heard everybody read it in a very useful way. Okay, not being misleaded in the <laughs> uh, a political reading, like uh, Evelyn, uh, Evelyn talking about, I think that's ex exactly right. When we read this one, we read, we think ourselves as ruler. So that's about the how to govern yourself, not about the president governing the people. The talk, talk, think about how to deal with daily things. I think that's exactly right. Or same as James talking about it in the highly competitive capitalism society. How are we going to think about it? Should we always buy the luxury good? Should we always want to push our kids to the uh, Ivy League elite school? Okay, does that make sense? I think that's the way that us think about it. And one more thing is about the traditional, this one being read in the Chinese intellectuals. Okay, I think the Chinese intellectual, if you know, it's for thousand years, so it's highly competitive to the national exam to become the government. So I think they read in this one as a mental relief. Okay, see, 
I wish they have the utopian world, right? We don't have to read all this, right? We don't have to, I, I think that's a lot. If you see a Chinese literature writing, a lot of people, a lot of Chinese point, they kind of refer this one that wish have this kind of world. So I think that's a, some kind of wishful thinking have given a highly competitive intellectual society in Chinese, especially in the traditional Chinese, give them a relief. Okay, that's the way to think. And the, another thing is, can I ask, um, Evelyn, you, can you read your translation on the very last two sentences? That's interesting. It's related to God, right? Are you, are you talking to me? Yes. Yes. Uh, Evelyn, Is related uh, to God? Okay. You want me to read the last two lines? The, the last two lines. Okay. Do, yeah, do nothing by your own strength, and God will accomplish all things. And this is okay. from the Tao of Christ, a Christian version of the Tao, Tao De Jing. Okay, I think you have the version only one have talking about God. Okay, I don't see anybody talk about God. And they have the reason. Uh, because <laughs> there's a word called Fu. That's Tian means heaven. Okay. And in most of uh, Chinese concept, Tian, heaven means God. Okay, that's correct. But uh, in the Chinese writing, if you write Tian, if like mm -hmm. you have one mistake, there's one point out a little bit, okay, that becomes Fu. That's a different word. So it could be, could be the, the mix of the two words, okay, because they discover from the antique writing, right? And the writing is not very clear. So people are arguing it should be means Tian, which is heaven or just the words called, okay, that therefore, you know, this one. So people are arguing. So most of people believe that's not heaven. And, but some people still believe that's heaven. So that's the historical account, why your translation specifically talk about God. Okay, so that's the, and we don't know which one is correct, but that's the different version. Yeah. Thank, uh, thank you. you, Jason. So uh, two people who have not spoken before, I'm gonna give them a chance to speak now. That's going to be Marco followed by Andrew. Marco, and then we'll go to the other people. Uh, Marco, go ahead. Um, I'm reading the Mitchell translation. Mm -hmm. um, and um, yeah, so um, I just think that the, um, basically you're uh, esteeming like, like if someone is like coming out of college and you know, um, um, if someone is like going into college and like um, they esteem like uh, a powerful person, they're, sort of like, you know, you're, they're identifying, um, you know, if you esteem that sort of, um, um, like you don't want to identify with a certain like uh, position, like or title, job title. So basically that you're good enough, like you're not defined by your job title, but you're sort of like, you're defined by your existence, like you're enough just by being, just by existing. And that, that's what I get from it. Thank you, Marco. Uh, next up is uh, Andrew. Andrew uh, yeah, I just wanted to comment uh, about something. I uh, So people said dark, that, that there's some dark aspect, meaning uh, leave people innocent, don't let them think too much. I think, I think there's something, uh, I don't think it's very dark. I think it's practical. Um, that's just my opinion. And that's going to piss people off. I mean, think about this. Do you think, what's the average, what's the level of depth in the average population? I mean, do you think everyone like us are going to sit here and talk about deep things? I think for the average, say 90% 90, 90 of the population, I think they're happy. They want a simple life. So I think we should remember this. It's very clever. I think it's very, very clever. It's not just uh, oppressing. And so it's very few people that want to reach that level of depth. Um, so I, I don't find it as dark. I, I find it very, very practical and realistic. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, next up is going to be Kevin, Madeline, and James. Kevin. Yes, thank, thank you. Um, I got it different, you know, from, the, you know, what I'm going to post this word, the word, uh, verb matters. This one is make, basically what's the cause effect. This is one thing from uh, uh, um, the new government perspective, 
this is like they got two four four type four word appear this paragraph, and also the three times use make people. The first, let's see if I use my own, you know, non translation like this. Don't promote good, make people uh, not compete with each other. When you promote something good, they say good people, good less talent. Is some people going to compete, compete fighting? So that that's uh, you can you can imagine yourself. Also. The second one is uh, uh, one, two, three, the third, fourth sentence is uh, um, make people not to stealing because. If you not value anything is good, yeah, people buy stone. It's, it's the same. Jam and uh, the, the stone is the same for me. So this this two second two part I will consider it from equity perspective. If people let's see, I own this equity, this valuable. Other people going to find for with this. The first two, I would say, it's uh, don't promote good, make people. Uh, not compete with each other. It's from equality. Let's see. Even next, uh, um, the third one is uh, still um, often make people uh, without know uh, knowing what your government is doing. Like, let's say you got a new policy, maybe favor to another one, another one. I don't need to think about that. If I don't think about that, don't I don't have a desire. If we keep make new policy, new bills favor one group of people, I will, yeah, I'm going to think about it. So I can make your own smart. That's following this one, going to make Sifu, that's just Jason and mention that is, that's, that's uh, extra negative meaning we consider is, it's a, a force is make, make a person, a man smarter. Smart people don't, you know, compete because with no, no ambiguous, everybody's equal. If we listen, we make something unequal, of course, people are going to make smart. How can I get this, uh, use this rule, make more money? The last one is still no, you know, um, no uh, effort is effort. Thank you. From government perspective, you do more, more mistake, more damage to others, maybe. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, next up is Madeline, followed by James. Madeline. Yes, um, I really appreciated David's comment about uh, the whole thing being ironic and what not to do. And also Andrew's, which is that um, a lot of people just really want to go ahead and live their lives and, you know, coach a softball team and enjoy life. Uh, what I was thinking of in our in the slightly earlier discussion of different kinds of desires and knowledge uh, was what Yasuhiko mentioned yesterday, which is something called mimetic desire. Uh, mimesis means imitative. So it's your desire. It's not imitating what other people have. It's your desire is imitating other people's desire. These people want this. Therefore, I want this. And the whole thing, uh, all of chapter three in this, then began to remind me of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. That basically uh, Lao Tzu is saying, keep people on the lower levels of physiological needs, of safety needs, and of belongingness and love needs. Keep them away from the upper levels of esteem needs, like prestige and feeling of accomplishment and the top level of which is achieving one's full potential including creative activities um, and those top two levels could lead to governmental overthrows they could lead to uh, the tall poppy syndrome which is one person excelling over the others which is uh, often disapproved of i'm not even going to limit that to chinese culture because it happens everywhere I think every language has a phrase for it. Uh, so I would say that this, uh, in a way, he's talking about higher, Maslow's hierarchy of needs and um, maybe the danger of mimetic desire. 
Thank you. Uh, thank you, Madeline. Next up is uh, James, followed by Paul. James. Yeah, I agree with that idea of uh, mimetic desires and, and uh, that the, the desires that are not natural, that fulfill your, your needs, you know, they are like uh, inordinate desires that are, that are, you know, um, uh, you know, that are implanted or, you know, that are, that we absorb, you know, from, uh, you know, from uh, commercialism and so forth. And I agree with uh, Evelyn Evanique's uh, no, notion, the, the translation of um, the Tao as, uh, as being God. But, you know, in, uh, in the other chapters in this book, uh, he refers to the Tao as something that, uh, that cannot be said. So, you know, unless you profess to know God, you know, then, uh, then that would be consistent, you know, with, uh, with what the Tao is. It's, it's, it's not, it's the highest uh, understanding of uh, what is, right? Mm -hmm. So it is that which you cannot really conceptualize or, or understand. So they say, he, he says, he who knows does not say, he who says does not know. Mm -hmm. So if God is the highest and that which you cannot really say what it is or know, then, then that, that would be, you know, uh, parallel with what uh, the Tao is. But uh, yeah, that's, that's what I want to say. Thanks. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, James. Um, next up is going to be Paul, followed by Mike. Paul. Yeah, my my thoughts change with every person speaking, but I'll try to stick to some degree to what I was going to say, which is, I think there's a chance to reconcile the threads going through here. And by that, I mean, I could be sitting here thinking that um, the big boss is trying to discourage me from wanting things and thinking too hard because he wants to covet his own position and uh, keep me down. But it could also be in my best interest to not clutter my mind with the desire for Teslas and lots of consumerism. And so just because someone is going to abuse a concept for their own purposes, because they haven't learned that lesson, because that guy who's trying to keep me down must not be following this lesson. He's accumulating stuff and he's not the sage who's not accumulating things. He's, he's your stereotypical ruler who wants all the riches. And so, I, you know, he could be misusing a deep truth, but it doesn't change the fact that it's a deep truth. So you can have both of these things happening at once, a Machiavellian use of truths and the fact that they can help you. That's my thought. Thank you, Paul. Uh, next up is going to be Mike. Mike, go ahead. Yeah, I waited so long to speak because like Paul, every time somebody brought something <laughs> up, this might have been the most diverse set of answers we, we've had in these so far. It's really amazing. But um, when Madeline talked about Maslow's hierarchy of needs, um, I've been fighting this idea or thinking about the, the idea that this triangle has actually been inverted, that people born today, especially if there's some affluence in the family or in the community, in the self-actualization part of that triangle, it's like everything else is almost a given. Like the bottom of that triangle, the broadest part is about the physiological needs and how important they are. But I, I think sometimes in the modern world, we just, we just take so much of that for granted, but it's the heaviest part of the triangle. It's the most important part. It's what sustains us. And if it gets inverted, if we're, if we're living our life just thinking always in the self-actualization phase about me and about what I want and where I'm going next without any understanding of what our feet are actually being supported by, um, that it, to me, it, I find it very confusing. So when Madeline brought up the, the triangle, I, I think it's important to keep that appreciation that it's not the, the expensive items that we have. It's really think about even what your house does for you or how you keep warm and clean water, like all those basics that sustain that triangle. So I think Lao Tzu sometimes says, you know, bring it down to where the understanding is down here instead of looking looking at the top all the time. So it was a great comment, Madeline. Excellent. Uh, thanks, Mike. Uh, next up is going to be Franklin, Kevin, and Dave. Franklin. 
If, if anybody hasn't seen the movie, The Gods Must Be Crazy, I'll just describe it real quickly. A primitive tribe uh, finds a Coke bottle that was thrown out of an airplane by a pilot. And this bottle is so handy. They can use it for this and they can use it for that. And before you know it, the tribe is at war over the possession of this bottle. So the, the head of the tribe has to go on a long walk to take it to the edge of the world to throw it back into heaven so that it doesn't disturb the harmony that they had all along. And I think that movie really captures what this chapter is trying to get at, that there is an original order. You know, we're social creatures. We live in groups with families and everything. Everybody understands their place and it's very simple and we can, we can get along. But once the city state develops, and the ego develops and it's about me against the world, a lot of trouble arises. So Lao Tzu is trying to call us back to this original harmony that, that if we can find that, things will go easily. Thanks, uh, Franklin. Uh, next up is Kevin followed by Dave. Kevin. Yeah, let's just uh, add up just, uh, just now I said, and uh, make and Madeline about uh, the basic needs. That's essential from government perspective. Give people the basic needs, fill up that. Nothing else people can figure out themselves. That's if you think about those words, it makes sense for me. Like if we can there a uh, desire and still on strings, have a good healthy body and uh, um, no, no, no hurry, no desire, then what's happy life? I cannot pursue what I want. Go to 52, leave me ID. <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Kevin. So what we're going to do, folks, is that we're going to have two last comments. And then we're going to go to number four, because which is a wonderful contrast, because we've been talking about number three, which is political ideas. Number four focuses on the Tao itself, uh, really focuses on the Tao. So, um, so it's going to be, oh, wait a minute, um, Donna, you've not spoken before, so I'm going to uh, jump you ahead. Uh, Donna, go ahead. I thought that Madeline's comment about Maslow's needs was very interesting. I'm just thinking, though, that for me anyway, when I read those needs, I see them beyond materialism and I see them as spiritual and enlightenment. So I can very easily see for me, this chapter is about enlightenment and, and I don't see that there's um, anything wrong with us pursuing enlightenment by just being present and letting the, um, the, the Tao Te Ching, which I think is really about each individual having that relationship with it, similar to the relationship that we each have with the divine and spirit or however you want to call that. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Donna. So last two, and then we will go to uh, number four, uh, Dave and Jean. Dave. Thanks, Rikant. Not to get too far off track, but I want to disagree about people in that time just walking around with nothing to do. I think most of those people are on the verge of starvation. I, when I was growing up in the 1950s, we were talking about Chinese peasants living on one meal a day, which is a little bit of rice. And I think now Chinese peasants have two meals a day. And in our country, I think 25% of our children are hungry. So it wasn't an easy life back then. Uh, and, I, and I really feel sorry for the folks from a rich background that are right at the top, start at the top of Maslow's hierarchy of needs and have no appreciation for uh, the rest of us. Anyway, thank you, thank you. I look forward to number four. Uh, next up is going to be Jean. Yeah, I wonder, uh, <clears throat> you know, people think about the past, like the hunter-gathering world. 
they tend to romanticize the face because I know the Sipen also mentioned, you know, it seems people eat healthier food when they hunt and then they actually become the farming is much less healthy, you know, they, all these things. But the point is like when you hunt, you don't always get the food and the, the old and the young will die easily. Mm -hmm. When you farm, you may not eat the healthy food, but at least you can survive. That's why you have such a human population growth. I think the same as this, uh, you know, the nostalgia about, and also the, I think the difference between people choose to uh, have no desire versus they were ignorant, you know, like they can be, the child can be innocent and it's beautiful and holistic, but it's not enlightened. I think it's very different between that stage and the enlightened stage of holistic. So I think it's, the ideally, everybody need to go through that desire, then come back through Dao De Jing to reach that undesire. So that's then you can really truly enlightened. Wonderful, wonderful point. All right, folks. So we're now going to number four. Um, and this is a beautiful contrast between number three and number four. So uh, who would like to start by reading their translation of uh, number four? Evanique. So folks, go ahead and uh, type an exclamation mark if you'd like to read your translation of number four. So it's going to be Evanique followed by Joe. Evanique. So uh, this is from the Divine Feminine Tao. Uh, the Tao is empty, yet when used, never exhaust an abyss that seems, the, that seems the ancestor of all. She softens our edges, loosens our entanglements, tempers our light, merges with ordinariness. So still, she seems ever present. We do not know whose child this is. She seems to have existed before creation. Wonderful. Each of these translations is so, so beautiful. Thank you. Uh, next up is Joe, Dave, Judith, and Maritza. Sure. Okay, I'm reading from the same version as before, the Wayne Dyer version, and this is the fourth verse. The Tao is empty, but inexhaustible, bottomless, the ancestor of it all. Within it, the sharp edges become smooth, the twisted knots loosen, the sun is softened by a cloud, the dust settles into place. It is hidden, but always present. I do not know who gave birth to it. It seems to be the common ancestor of all, the father of all things, of, of things. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Uh, next up is going to be Dave, followed by Judith. Dave. The way is empty, yet when you use it, you never need fill it again. Like an abyss, it seems to be the ancestor of the 10,000 things. It files down sharp edges and ties the tangles, softens the glare, and settles the dust. Submerged, it seems perhaps to exist. We don't know whose child it is. It seems to have even preceded the Lord. Wonderful, thank you, Dave. Uh, next up is Judith followed by Maritza. Judith. Wow, this is crazy. Um, cause mine's seven lines and I'm listening to yours and they're like, go on and on, it's crazy. All right, so mine's Stephen Mitchell um, translation. The Tao is like a well, used but never used up. It is like the eternal void filled with infinite possibilities. It is hidden, but always present. I don't know who gave birth to it. It is older than God. Wonderful, thank you. Next up is Maritza. Um, I think I'm gonna read my attempt at translating this one. Oh, wonderful. Um, the way is an empty vessel that can be used, but will never overflow. In its profound depth resides the origin of all things. It softens all edges, dissolves confusion, tempers splendor, merges with all grains of dirt and sand, deep and hidden, but ever present. It is unknown who birthed it, 
but it is older even than nature. Wow, that's beautiful. Thank you. Thank you, Maritza. That's great. Uh, next up is Jean. Jean, could you first read uh, in uh, Chinese and then English? Sure. 冲道而用之或不赢. Wow, I can't read this word. <laughs> 渊西四万物之宗, 错其瑞, 解其分, 合其光, 同其成, 晨曦四祸存, 无不知谁之子, 向地之先, yeah, I have this book and they have Chinese on the side, but it's all the traditional Chinese, hard to read. <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm reading this translation as uh, this one, John yep. Manford, yeah. The Tao is empty, but in practice need never be filled. The Tao is feather, uh, featherless, like the ancestor of married things. Smooth the edge, loosen the tangles, soft, soften the light. Merge with the dust. The door is crystalline and still. It seems to have been there forever. I know not whose child it is. It seemed to have been before the emperor of the old. Wonderful. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Jean. Next up is Brian. Brian, go ahead. The doubt is like the emptiness of a vessel, and in our employment of it, we must be on our guard against all fullness. How deep and unfathomable it is, as if it were the honored ancestor of all things. We should blunt our sharp points and unravel the complications of things. We should attemper our brightness and bring ourselves into agreement with the obscurity of others. How pure and still thou is as if it were ever so, continue. I do not know whose son it is. It might appear to have been before God. Wonderful, thank you. Thank you, Brian. All right, uh, if anybody wants to read, you can, this is your last chance to go ahead and uh, line up for reading your favorite translation. Okay, give it, 10 seconds and then go ahead and type in a oh, Franklin, go ahead. This is the Jia Fu Feng Jane English. The Tao is an empty vessel. It is used, but never filled. Oh, on 10,000 things. Put the sharpness, untangle the knot, soften the glare, merge with dust. Oh, hidden deep, but ever present. I do not know from whence it comes. It is the forefather of the emperors. Wonderful. All right, folks. So now it's time for your thoughts on this poem. We'll start with Madeline. Madeline, go ahead. Yes. <clears throat> um... I, I just wanted to comment on the, uh, the quality or the type of writing in this one. It reminds me of uh, poem number two, which we had discussed uh, the last time. Um, high and low rest upon each other, voice and sound harmonize each other, front and back follow one another. In other words, the um, the sort of Lakoff and Johnson metaphors we live by. It also, uh, this one for, it reminds me of Dante in a way, in how very specific the, phys the physical imagery is. And at the same time, um, it's a reminder that unlike the uh, holy literature of Western civilization, the Tao, it's not full of little narratives. It's not full of stories like Aesop or the Bible. Um, it has concrete imagery in it, but it doesn't um, proceed as little stories with a beginning, middle, or an end. And so in that way, it's 
it's extremely different from what many people here have encountered before. <clears throat> Wonderful, thank you. Thank you. And it's really stunning to see the differences in style um, and both, both kind of matter and style. Um, next up is Dave, Joe, Evanique, and Franklin. Dave. Yes, Trikhan, if you'll indulge me a little bit, I have a very scholarly translation and I have some commentary. It uh, won't be too long, but I think it's additional information. Sure. Uh, text A has a synonym, Hsiao, H-S-I-A-O, deep and still for yawn, abyss in line three, and the Juai, sharp edges, is submitted in line four, one assumes a copy error. This chapter varies little from the standard Lu Zhao Xu form. The Yu, again, for Huo, perhaps, in line two is a known variant, and the Cho, file down, for Cho, press down, would appear to be the right word. In the Mount Wang Tui texts have Ying fill instead of man fill at the end of line two. The change to man in later editions was one of the number of subs substitutions made to avoid the personal name of an emperor. In the case, the name of the emperor Hui of the Han dynasty, Lui Ying. Lord Ti was the name of a supreme deity of the Shang people. Ti was also used as name for supreme god of the Shou through their more commonly used in name heaven. Thank you. Thank you. It's very useful information. Thank you, Dave. Uh, next up is going to be Joe Evanique and Franklin. Joe. Yeah, I mean, the one line that really stuck out to me on this is the ancestor of it all. And, uh, you know, I got the sense of a deity uh, in this particular um, in, in this particular verse. And that was a that was a that was something that, you know, just really kind of stuck out to me if more than anything else. Uh, this particular one as well, the idea of transition uh, and the idea of the opposites when you're talking about sharp edges becoming smooth uh, and twisted knots loosening. Um, and uh, some of the ideas of cause and effect that came to mind as well. But um, yeah, those are my initial thoughts. Wonderful. Thank you, Joel. Uh, next up is going to be Evanique. Franklin and Maritza. Evanique. Yeah, one of the things I thought about is when reading this is source. Um, in the divine feminine, when you study the divine feminine, they talk about going back to the source or to energy. And through this, I, I felt that especially when um, it, the first line where it says the towel is empty, yet when used, never exhaust. It's always like we, like human beings, we get exhausted and we get tired, but we can always go back to the source where we'll fill our energy. And it's like, no matter what you call it, you can call it Tao, you can call it God, you can call it source, you can call it goddess, whatever it is. Where however, we our finite minds try to define it. We know it's this big, it, it's a big empty space where everyone can get fulfilled. And uh, especially where it talks about, she softens our edges. It's like a lot of times because of our experience in life, it can harden us and it can give us a, so, a hard edges. And if you tap into it, you know that no one can really hurt you if you're tied to this source. Like she softens your edges, but she shows strength in that last line. Well, sorry, that next to last line, she says, she seems to have existed before creation. So if you're putting your trust in the source or in God or whatever you want to call it, this is before she existed before creation. So you're tapping into the most powerful source of the universe, which some do call the universe. So. Uh, wonderful. Uh, Evanique, um, it, given the point that Joe made and the point that you're making about the connection to the divine, can you read from the translation that you use for number three and yes. see what, what it is and how, how it matches? 
Sure. Give me one second. So this is Christ is a well that never runs dry. He is the internal source. All things come through him. He blunts what is sharp, loosens what is tight, shades the unprotected. In him, all things hold together. He is hidden, yet in plain sight. Unbirthed, he is the ancient one. Wonderful, wonderful. Um, so absolutely, I, I see the, see the div divine coming out from, from this most explicitly uh, than, than other places. Um, next up is going to be Franklin, Maritza, Paul, and Mike. Franklin. Yeah, this, uh, one of the translations of the Tao is the way, and I, I get a feeling like we're, we're learning something about the way, uh, an instruction, you know, blunt the sharpness, untangle the knot, soften the glare. This is the way. These are like, here are some clues as to how to get there. And one of my favorite lines in the whole book, merge with dust. <laughs> I love that line. But then the other thing is, we go from merge with dust to hidden deep, but ever present. I don't know where it comes from. It is the forefather of the emperor. So we go from like dust, which is the lowest thing, insignificant, to the most sublime, all encompassing divine, right? And, and all of this in just a couple of lines. It's, it's it's just masterful. Wonderful. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Franklin. Uh, Maritza. That's interesting that I go after that comment. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, the, um, because the, the words dust, merge with dust, what it brought to mind for me was actually um, our ancestors. You know, it's the, the whole concept that all, like we, we spoke, um, I think, in chapter two, we spoke about how, you know, it's the, we were talking about the comparisons with the figure in the ground and how every little grain of soil or sand or dust, it's all like connected. Mm -hmm. And when I saw the dust here, it made me think of, you know, our ancestors, because they're talking about, you know, that which it, it comes, it's so old, it comes before, like the... I, I read a couple, like in, in Spanish more often than in English, they, instead of saying that it predates either the gods or the emperors, they say it predates nature. And that resonates with me because it's like, wait, but nature was here like before everything, this comes before nature. So like that visual to me is like impactful. And um, I, I did think um, it's interesting that, you know, Franklin was saying that like dust is the, the lowest and then it goes to this great divine because I, I just, I view it as not, not a transformation, but as a reminder that they're one and the same, that it just, it all just flows one into the other. Wonderful. I, I like the point about figure and ground because that, that middle paragraph there is really pointing to that. That's like, that's the ground. That's so, the way I see it. Yeah. Uh, wonderful. Next up is Paul, Mike, and Kevin. Paul. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you gave the introduction you did, Srikant, because it invited me to do what I want to do here, which is to look at what we know about the physical world now. And this is a poetic description of what we know now. We know that an atom is mostly empty space. We know that the basic ground, there is no glare. We are merged with the dust. There, there, everything is sort of this soft energy field. It's like totally consistent. And we're blessed to have all that knowledge. And here's this guy who wrote that in 500 BC. So it's just like a mir miraculous and beautiful. So that's all I wanted to say. Wonderful. Excellent, mm -hmm. excellent, thank you. Uh, let's see, next up is going to be Mike followed by Kevin. Mike. 
Yeah, I like the middle of the Wayne Dyer translation. Uh, it, it starts with, within it, the sharp edges become smooth. And I, I like it for ourselves. Like, I think tonight, this whole meetup for me, I don't have an edge as we're talking with each other. In other words, to me, it just feels like a very natural flow of ideas and communication, where in other parts of my life, if I'm talking to a client or if I'm just doing something day to day where there's an agenda attached, it's a totally different feeling. Hence, you know, we say you come home and take the edge off of something. So I, I think it's important that, you know, we do stuff like we're doing now. Uh, and then at the end of it, to Joe's comment, when he's talking about the common ancestor of all, um, it ends with the father of things. So I've always heard the sage referred to in the masculine, but the creator, I've always heard mother Tao, more that the creator of it all was always feminine. This is the first time, to my knowledge, I, I mean, I, I think I've seen three translations that he's, it's almost like he's referring to the creator as being masculine, where I always have heard mother Tao in the past. So I don't know if anybody else has come across that idea. Um, I really like your point about the conversation um, because I think the thing that characterizes this conversation that we are having is that there is a lot more listening going on on the part of everybody than is common. Most of the conversations, there is a lot more talking going on and listening is just to say, okay, what are you going to talk next? So it's like, it's whereas here, and that's very much of a Taoist kind of idea where you're trying to listen to nature, listen to the Tao, so you can act in accordance with it. It also leads to this fluidity. You know, several people said what they were planning to say keeps changing <laughs> with everybody, everybody who is saying. So that, you know, that's also a testimony to that people are actually listening and they are modifying what they are planning to speak based on that. So there is this give and take between, um, between things, which is what um, this is about. Excellent. Uh, next up is Kevin followed by Gene. Kevin. Thank you. I, I want to point one thing about the author self, Lao Tzu, how, how his attitude about embrace ignorance from chapter one. Uh, though is an, if you can name it though or name self, it's not eternal. And here he mentioned again, before that, we, uh, he mentioned, I don't know where the child, uh, though it is, it's older than a ancestor. Uh, it looks like a sauce, maybe that's he, he still gets like his heart to connect to ourselves, like. Uh, we try to pursue learning knowledge, learning ourselves. In the middle, you know, he put a harmonized uh, light and you like uh, united all dusk. dusk. So it's, it, it's profound. Also, if I want to connect to the chapter two and chapter three, that's why chapter two, he said, um, the beauty and ugly, you know, it's 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 general to each other. Being or not being, so that's based on current understanding. It's general to each other. We don't know yet. The chapter three today, we early on is about um, no action is good action. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Kevin. Um, another thing that I see in this this chapter or this poem, uh, it is talking about the Tao. But I'm just, I was just thinking about the way it is talking about the Tao. And there is a sense of wonder, you know, with all these descriptions that are there, there is a sense of wonder, which is the undercurrent of the entire poem. So it is like that response uh, to, to the Tao, which is really, really fascinating. Uh, next up is Jean followed by Madeline. Jean. Yeah, so I'm reading this. Uh, I actually look through the Chinese translation too because I had a hard time to understand what they're trying to say. Mm -hmm. And my understanding actually come to, I agree the middle part actually is very critical because the front, the top, the top part and the bottom part, they already said at the beginning. 
you know, it's from emptiness and it's, you know, it's a, it's kind of origin of everything. But the middle part actually is telling you how to reach the Tao. So you soothe the edge, loosen the tangle, soften the light, merge the dust. So it's kind of like, I'm trying to, because in Chinese it's like, Suo qi rui. Qi means somebody's, you know, I was like, who's, who they try to soften the edge? So I was wondering, you're like, so, but it's such a great way of teaching how to be, be a person, you know, like we have to learn how to not be too aggressive, you know, like it seems teach us how to be, to get the doll, to be an enlightened person. So it seems, I try to understand who is the qi, you know, who the doll trying to <laughs> sharpen, you know, soften the edge. Then I realized maybe it's for us, uh, it's due to ourselves to reach the doll. So my understanding is this part is actually teaching us how to get the Tao through this middle practical things to do to reach the Tao. Then they tell us, you know, then the beginning and the end, more like the res resonate of the big, what they said earlier. You know, that's my understanding. Oh, that's, that's excellent. Um, I, I think Franklin also made the same point. Um, now the way in which, for example, Indian philosophy deals with it, is the idea of when Tao is called the Brahman and your soul, yourself, the core of you is called Atma. And the basic principle, the, like the core principle is Tat Tvam Asi, you are that. So there is an equivalence between nature as a whole and your nature. And everything that applies to the Tao or the Brahman applies to your own core. So it kind of, that's how kind of Indian philosophy um, deals with it. Um, and it's, it's kind of analogous uh, to this. Next up is Madeline, followed by Brian. Madeline. Yes, uh, I agree. It is, it's not only completely analogous, it really is talking about the same thing. Yes. Um, and I love that about it. Uh, I love the phrase untangle the knot because in Western culture, we have uh, the Gordian knot and the way to solve the problem was to cut through it with a sword. And untangling the knot implies more patience as if you're sitting with a bundle of tangled yarn that you're going to weave or you are working with a fishing net, which was a very common thing to do. And you would have to untangle things and then re-knot them. Uh, what I was actually going to say was a sort of side excursion that's slightly academic. It's about the last line, uh, which is in, in my translation says, it is the forefather of the emperors. Um, in the genealogy of kings, um, especially in, in Nordic genealogy, there's a tradition of tracing your ancestry back to specific gods. So in other words, back in the mists of time, the ruler is descended from the gods. And so the current thinking is that, um, that this, this is done on purpose, either consciously or unconsciously, to give a ruler <clears throat> legitimacy. But on the other hand, it also speaks to an incredible uh, level of mythos. Um, so I can't say I'm a thousand percent in agreement with the modern thinking on it. Thank you. Um, next up is going to be Brian followed by Ping Ping. Brian. Yeah, I want to compare the uh, poem two and the poem four. In the poem two, um, the poem talks about how opposites arise, or that the opposites do arise. And this uh, poem talks about how opposites uh, wane. So I would say that the opposites wax and the opposites wane and the waxing and the waning is the towel wonderful thank you 
next up is going to be Brian. Oh, no, not Brian. Sorry. Ping Ping and Franklin. Frank, Ping Ping. Okay, so I just want to say that uh, someone uh, earlier mentioned about untangle the nods, and I found this is a very interesting, tiny little detail, because besides of the patience, I, I would say it also kind of um, bring this gentleness of the person who untangle the nods um, to show to the towards the this nod, because it did not destroy it, it returned um the 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 robe into its original state so it's it, it to me it shows some respect and the gentleness that's it wonderful thank you uh next up is franklin thank you i wanted to pick up where madeline left off and this idea of of mythos so we have logos the rational mind which is spirit and we have mythos, which is the dream time, the imagination, emotion, and instinct. And Western culture has really sidelined mythos and concentrated on logos almost exclusively. And I think the Tao has a little a spotlight on mythos, and it calls it the mother of the 10,000 things. Uh, this is a very deep and important point that our culture has reduced the divine feminine, has sidelined it so dramatically that we tend to think it's not real. The problem is that in this faculty, which is a 50 million year old brain, on top of it is a monkey that's about 400,000 years old. And this monkey has taken over the, the whole thing. But this 400,000 year old monkey is riding a 50 million year old horse. That 50 million year old horse is the mother, the Tao. And our our, our task, in a sense, is to figure out that there's this monkey <laughs> with, a lot of, with a lot of emotional problems. And, and our job is to turn our attention back upon ourself and straighten this out so that we realize this 50 million year old brain is more than just delusion. It's more than just deceit. It's more than just fear and problematical emotional problems. It also contains astonishing, mystical, numinous, divine reality. But to get to that shining gem, we have to confront the delusional, the misconception, all of these problems inherent in the soul, right? So straightening that out is really the key. Wonderful observation, uh, Franklin. So we are actually doing a full meetup on this dance between Logos and Mythos. It's going to be this Sunday at 2.30. Um, the, this is a very large issue. The logos is the definite, it is the specific, it is something that is written down and it is shaped by that. It has a sense of definiteness because it lives on a piece of paper and it is treated mistakenly as reality itself. The symbol, <laughs> it is the symbol which is represented. Mythos is the generative process which ideally produces it. And Logos is very valuable because you can't really build too much with this continuous swarm of, uh, of mythos. And so, but it is properly seen as, a, as the kind of coagulation of this process. But moment that process stops, that becomes dead weight and actually starts to kill 
the living process. So there is this dance that goes on between them. Consider, for example, what we are doing now. Okay, the oral medium is very close to mythos. For example, Plato in his Republic banned the poets. He, he, he basically removed poets. He banished them from his Republic. Why? Because mythos, which was all of Homeric tradition, he thought it was opposed to logos. And he said, logos is what you need. Get rid of mythos. Logos can do it by itself. Okay. It's profoundly wrong. Yeah. That is not how, for example, Bible sees it. Bible sees when you look at um, religion, logos is sacred. But logos, there is a correspondence in allegories and parables which is mythos, which actually supports the logos. So there is a dance between logos and mythos. Consider this conversation. We are all reading, that is logos. We are coming up with our conclusions, which we hopefully write down. Mm -hmm. That is also logos. But being open to the conversation, going back and forth like this, in high definition, you're carrying, this is carrying not just the dry words, whether written by Lao Tzu, a translator or yourself, but it is carrying the gestures, it is carrying the tone, it is carrying the emotion, not just of one person, but of multiple people. And you're letting that flow over the logos work that you've already done and you are letting it modify it because you're remaining open to to the Tao, to the meaning of what you're dealing with. Now that way of holding logos is very powerful and logos in that configuration is very powerful. But moment it loses the support of the mythos, it begins to die, begins to deviate from life, and it becomes a killer. It begins to actually ossify and stultify life. This, whatever I'm saying right now, is based on Walter Ong's ideas. His seminal book is Orality and Literacy. And we had Sarah, who was one of the co-editors of his last book, talk last a uh, couple Sundays ago about this. And Tom uh, Zlatic is going to be, um, you know, he was actually a close associate of Walter Ong. And he's going to be talking about this theme. It's the theme is language as interpretation. The, everything that I said about interpretation is actually based on Walter Ong's work of letting, you know, that there is this dance between definiteness and being open to the ground, open to your unconscious, open to what is at the edge of your conscious and inviting it in, in order to reshape and rejuvenate your formulated things. So that's what, and the uh, Walter Ong is a person who has described it in the most exquisite terms. Um, and Tom is, uh, you know, he, it's the best capturing of Walter Ong's work and this idea of the dance between mythos and logos. So Franklin, any, any thoughts? Yeah, uh, in, in Logos is mathematics, the eternal universal language. So that is a very essential piece to understand. Logos has the mathematical universal language, but mythos contains the moral of the story. We can use mathematics to go to the moon 
but that will not bring the moral of the story. Mythos has the moral of the story, but Logos has the universal language that is an astonishing, ineffable mystery. Where does that come from? Wonderful, wonderful. Uh, thank you, uh, Franklin. And Franklin, thanks for bringing, it this bringing up this point. Madeline, you're next. Oh, uh, I think that must have been an old exclamation point. Okay, all right, that's that's good. Uh, okay, folks, so I thought this worked out really well. I thought this combination of number three and number four was a perfect combination, which captures both kind of the metaphysical issues and uh, political issues at, at both kind of edge of it, uh, with but some kind of aspects of epistemology and ethics in, in the middle. So uh, wonderful. And uh, folks, this is an excellent, excellent series. I'm just so pleased with this conversation. Um, and I'm thankful to people who actually know Mandarin and who are able to bring that in. I'm also thankful to people like Franklin who have been studying this, Franklin or Mike, who've been studying this for so long. Uh, so Jason, Phil, James, Kevin, uh, Jean, um, you know, just thank you so much. And what, what it does is that it makes this conversation very rich. And, you know, people like Andrew who brings in Jung and it just, it's just such a, such a great, uh, such a great group of people. So we're going to do this. We are going to continue this um, on next Tuesday. So it will be every week, Tuesday at 9 p.m. Eastern time. Um, I also want to invite you to this Friday's uh, meetup on iDAO, which is really the another way of looking at this relationship between the DAO and the sage, um, you know, or what is the proper approach of a human being towards Tao and what is it that distracts you from it? And what is it, how do you kind of separate out this relationship between you and the Tao and you and 10,000 things? Um, what, you know, how, 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 do you, how do you manage those? And this is in completely different terminology of uh, Martin Buber, who's very difficult to read. I've put a translation on the page if you go to 52 Living Ideas and look for the Friday meetup. I put a 10 minute video summarizing his thoughts, which do a fantastic job of summarizing it, by the way. And then I've also put a link to the translation. The entire book is not that long. Uh, so if you want, you can read it. Uh, even if you don't read it, you can come and talk about kind of the importance of kind of relation to having an authentic relation to nature or another human being or to a tree uh, versus this utilitarian um, kind of temporary kind of uh, relationship. So it's a very profound topic and it actually it's talking about the same themes in that we're talking about today in a different language. So looking forward to that. Thank you very much, everybody. This has been a tremendous honor and pleasure always to have such great minds communicate at this level. So thank you. Good night, everybody. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Good night, all. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.